lovely to see you. We're going to, we're going to begin. It's a couple of minutes after 11. So apologies for a little bit of tardiness. <coughs> My fault. But it's good to see you. You and all. Yes, too. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It's we good. missed you. It's good to be together on the Lord's Day. And it's wonderful to be able to gather in the presence of Jesus. Because at the end of the day, the most important person yes. is him, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we are important to him, which is good for us, but he's the one that we come to gather around, it's the one we come to encounter, it's the one we come to, he's the one we come to hear as he speaks to us. Let's come to our congregational worship. Now, if you've got a Bible, please turn with me to Psalm 40. We're going to use that. As we hear God call us to worship him through his word. Psalm 40, as you know, is a wonderful psalm. And it comprises two parts. He gives thanks for the many past mercies that the psalmist has experienced and received from God. And I hope that's something today that we can identify with that we've received past mercies from God. And then, of course, it presents, if you like, the today. You know, the today we all face, where, again, we need God's help, don't we? We even need God's help to praise. We need God's help to focus on Him. You know, there might be things competing for your attention, even, even in this room this morning. Might be what, what's happened in your week, or what's going to happen this week. Might be personality might be a relationship so we need God's help this morning that we might worship him the point of Psalm 40 of course and that both parts recognise is that God's mercy is given wonderfully and freely and graciously by God it can restore and revive us and it can actually lead to others rejoicing in God <coughs> Imagine that your experience of God's mercy can lead others to rejoice in the Lord. This is what Psalm 40 says. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. <coughs> he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and burnt offerings you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O oh Lord, to deliver me. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back. And brought to dishonour who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame. Who say to me, aha, 
Aha! But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Amen. Amen. Let's rise together, shall we? going to quickly pray and then we're going to sing all for a thousand <coughs> tongues and let's take the opportunity to respond to God's call to worship the Lord is truly here with, amongst his people and he's called us to worship him Heavenly Father, Lord our desire this morning is to be aware of the mercies that we have received in the past but also to recognise our need of you again this morning Oh, we thank you for calling us to worship. And we thank you that everything has been done for us in Christ, that we can approach you, Lord. That way that has been opened is a new and a living way. We thank you that we can come to the throne of grace. Whatever our condition this morning, and we can find mercy, and we can find grace to help us. Lord, we rejoice that we worship you, the living God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, merciful and gracious, all-powerful and all-knowing. And yet even in that all-knowing, Lord, you think of us and you've set your love upon us. Lord, help us praise you as we ought. Lord, help us to honour and glorify you together today. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So 
I'm keeping us and watching over us. And oh Lord, that your mercy is abundant to us. And oh Lord, this morning we want to worship you and praise and exalt the living God. Lord, we want to praise our Redeemer, the one who died for us, the one who rose again, the one who is interceding for our behalf. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you will be exalted and I'm going to return to singing together and expressing our worship in response to God's word. But we're going to take a moment just to steady ourselves. To ready to be ready for God to speak to us. <coughs> Father, as we come to your word, we're grateful that you look down on us with compassion. We're grateful, Lord, for as we've sung, you've expressed your love for us, you've shown us great patience, you've lavished riches of kindness upon us, particularly in the blood payment that Christ made on the cross. Lord, in that payment, Lord, your justice was demonstrated. Your wrath was satisfied fully, once for all. Your love was shown as you saved a people who would be drawn from every language, nation, people group, and tribe. Father, you've drawn us together this morning. And yet we recognise still that, as has been prayed, we are still needy. We still sometimes soil ourselves spiritually by walking according to the desires of our hearts still affected by sin. Lord, we see the remains of sin around us in our world, but also in our own hearts. So Lord, we ask that you would cleanse us from that. Lord, we thank you that you are a saviour who cleanses from sin. Lord, you are a saviour who transforms <coughs> us from who we were into the character and nature of Christ. And Lord, we, we desire with all our being to cooperate with that process. We don't want to be who we were. We want to be who you've called us to be. Lord, so... In that vein, we, we ask that you'd help us to be ready for your word. Lord, we recognise that your ways are not our ways. Neither are your thoughts our thoughts. But we do know that you send your word out and it accomplishes that for which it has been prepared. So Lord, as we hear you speak, Lord, may our hearts be prepared. May we be still good soil. In your sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 40 through 45. So our hearts desire week by week as a, as a church, as a fellowship, that we would recognize the, import, <coughs> the importance of hearing God speak to us. There's nothing greater than hearing the living God speak to his people. If you're not used to that, it might seem strange. It's a strange thing to do, to come and to sit and let somebody talk for 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half. <laughs> but, the Bible, but the Bible says that it's necessary. Not because the person at the front is the one with power and you are sort of just you know, learning from that. No, preaching is not about that. Preaching is an, an applicatory gift whereby God speaks to his people. So God speaks to me <coughs> through preaching or whoever's preaching as well as those who just hear. 
And we're all, if you like, listening for him to speak. And we believe that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. Yeah. This is what Mark writes. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and went and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Stated in Psalm 40, I don't know if you, if you caught it, the psalmist confesses to, the, to God, you are great God, but as for me, I'm poor and needy. One of the facts about being human, one of the things about the human condition, is that we are what the Bible calls dependent beings. In other words, we have a whole series and different levels of needs. Some of those are quite basic. We need air, we need food, we need water, we need shelter, we need clothing, and we need sleep in order just to continue to survive as physical beings. Some of you, perhaps in your work, uh, may be familiar with something called Maslow's Triangle. Um, it's a triangle of needs, uh, psychologists called Maslow, believe it or not, strangely enough, that's why it's called the Maslow's Triangle. He proposed a scheme, or if you like, a hierarchy of human needs. Actually, five levels of different needs that go from the most basic to what you might call the, to, to a whole series of higher needs. I don't, I'm not going to talk psych, psychology to you today, but they start out at what we might call the physiological. You know, air, water, slit shelter. Goes up into issues like safety and security. Then there's another layer where we talk where he talked about love and belonging. <coughs> and then if if you idea at the level of what we call esteem. And then finally, at the very, at the very top, according to his triangle, I'm not endorsing it, he talks about purpose, something he called self-actualization. Now I say that. And, and, and I have to, uh, as I say this, and I have to admit, as someone who's worked in education and social care and the charity sector, dealing with people who pr might present with multiple and sometimes complex needs, that there are elements of truth in that system. We might not agree with the order, we might not agree with all the ingredients, we might not agree with the foundations, but there are, observationally at least, things that which we know are that fit each one of us. In our passage today, we come across an episode that begins with what we might call a consuming need. If you remember, we're studying the Gospel according to Mark, and we've said in this first chapter, indeed this first act or this first section of the Gospel, this fast-moving account of the life and ministry of Jesus, that Mark has placed a large block of incidents, episodes in the life and the ministry of Jesus as he set out show, to show us a number of things. He sets these before us to show us the identity of Jesus through what he says and what he does. He sets before us the power of Christ as he brings God's kingdom into reality. He sets before us all the different responses to what Jesus says and does. Responses of faith. People reach out their hands. 
reach out with their hearts, if you like, and put their faith in Jesus and who he's revealed to be. There's other responses though, isn't there? There's responses of doubt. Is he really who he says he is? Can it be true? There's responses of, of scorn and unbelief. No, he's a charlatan. He's not who he says he is. And in the midst of all that, there's some responses of just the basic confused. I don't know what to think. And again, you might sort of recognise yourself in some of those responses even today. I trust, hopefully, most of us here would categorise ourselves, would place us in that response of faith. We have seen who Jesus is. We have beheld, in a sense, his glory. And we have been drawn to him in faith and love. We've repented of our sins. We've put our faith in Christ. And we are following on the way. We are walking day by day. Seeking to be willingly obedient to Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. This is what the gospel writer does. And all the while, the gospel writer is outlining, in a sense, and reinforcing these ideas about who Jesus is. About what sort of Messiah he's going to be. That's the, if you like, the majority of what chapter one is about. And so this episode, this particular incident, this story of a particular person's consuming needs and of Jesus' response to it, forms part of this bigger storyline. Now one of the problems we have, of course, is when we read these verses at the end of chapter 1, is that we have a, a, a particular distance from the culture and the society in which Jesus was born into. The term, for instance, and the issue of leprosy is not one, particularly in Western culture, that we particularly particularly identify with. Those of you from different parts of the world might be more familiar with both the medical diseases that, in a sense, form this term as it was understood in the Bible, and in terms of things like this. Interestingly enough, the term leprosy that's mentioned here uh, probably covered a number of actual conditions. and spoke to, the, spoke to the whole idea of this as being more than just a mere medical problem. You know, leprosy and the idea of being a leper had a, if you like, a theological background. Had a, it had a social background, both for the, the Jews who had grown up under God's law and for the surrounding nations. It's interesting that people of the time, there was a <clears throat> rough contemporary of Jesus, slightly later, um, a guy, a, a pro-Roman Jewish historian called Josephus. And he wrote a book called The Antiquities. He wrote a couple. But one of them, The Antiquities, is particularly relevant because it speaks into the time of Jesus from a position where he's not particularly pro-Jesus, but he is aware of Jesus' existence, aware of, of the movement of burgeoning Christianity, And he speaks in particular ways toward that. But one thing he says in particular is important. He said that in the first century, being a leper was in no way different from being a corpse. Think about that. Being a leper, suffering whatever disease it may have been medically, was socially no different than being dead. Except you were still alive. A walking corpse. A leper, of course, was someone that the culture of the day considered a complete outcast. We might struggle, in, again, in our culture for categories. And even when we speak of such categories, it might be difficult to, to sort of think of them and, and, and to speak of them. But they were a complete outcast. Often, Across cultures, they were deemed to have been cursed. Of course, the Old Testament has a particular background, doesn't it? In terms of being judged unclean. The Old Testament background is interesting because in Leviticus 13 and 14, it discusses, in a sense, this disease as, in terms of it showing a level of ceremonial uncleanness. 
And distilling that down, if you read the section, it's not necessarily a pleasant section, but if you distill it down, and that isn't easy, it, it was seen as a problem whose cure could only come from the Lord. It was actually seen as more than just a medical disease. Other illnesses, if you, if you read the video, could be dealt with, could be healed. But, but leprosy had to be both healed and cleansed. That's important. It had to be healed and it had to be cleansed. In fact, some have likened what, what the uh, rules and the prescriptions in, in Le Leviticus 13 show us is as leprosy as a, as a picture. And a particular picture of sin. The tests for it. What it does. It's often shown as a picture of a deeper and, if you like, darker condition. A condition that we all have suffered from. So, for instance, in Leviticus 13, it says, Leprosy is deeper than the skin. That's a picture of sin, isn't it? Sin isn't just, sin isn't just something we do. It's not just skin deep. It relates to our nature. It relates to who we are. Or at least to who we've been. It's, it, it says, it spreads. Part of the interesting way that the Old Testament law worked it was, was that cleanliness, ritual cleanliness, wasn't catching. But uncleanness was. If, if, you, if you had purified yourself to approach the tabernacle or the temple and you touched a leper, you came into contact with a contaminated thing, you were then unclean and you had to go through the process of cleanliness again. So it could be spread from one thing to another, just like sin. The Bible says what sin is universal. John reminded us in his prayer that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. It was said in Leviticus 13 that Leprosy defiles and isolates. Two words and two ideas that really speak certainly to me of sin. What is the result of sin? It is being defiled before God. It is being isolated from the goodness and the grace of God. And in the latter part of the chapter it says, things, things touched in that way, things contaminated by this condition were really only fit for the fire. And there's a picture in, in sense that there, isn't there? That really all that sin fits us for is eternal punishment. All sin fits us for, as Jesus often said, is for to be, is to be thrown into Gehenna. Gehenna, of course, as you know, was the, was the rubbish tip that was built in the Valley of Kidron in, near Jerusalem. And it was a place where fire and smoke continually bellowed as, as, as rubbish was incinerated. And Jesus used that as a picture of eternity, a picture of final punishment, a, fic, a picture of condemnation before God to those who wickedly refuse to believe in the Son whom he has sent. So there's that picture and that relationship going on in the background between leprosy as a, as a condition and sin. Now, I'd spend time in that, not to make you sort of writhe in your seat particularly, think, oh, I don't want to think about this, but hopefully to help picture the outrageous nature of what occurs in these five verses. A leper comes to Jesus. I hope it gives you a picture of this person's consuming need. You know, I don't know if you've ever had this, I'm sure you have as a human being, I know I've had. I've sometimes had a need that, that whether it was important or not in other people's eyes, actually consume me. It becomes the thing that, that, that I can't get over. It might be in something internal, it might be something to do with, with one's background, it might be something to do with a, an instance in life, it might be something to do with a relationship, it might be something to do with all sorts of things, but they, they, can, they can consume you, can't they? One of the things about ongoing sickness and pain, pain is something like that, isn't it? Sometimes physical pain can be consuming. It's not that you want to dwell on it, but that it almost drains you from doing anything else. Well, I want us to picture this guy's need in that way. It was something that had consumed him. This disease that had taken 
in a sense, and was taking his very humanity from him. Again, that's another thing where, where leprosy is like sin in that sense. Because that's what sin does, of course. Sin's not in many people's vocabulary in our society, but sin is dehumanizing. That's why one day when we're, when we're with Christ, we'll be the most human we've ever been because we'll, there won't be even the presence of sin. We won't have the desire or ability to sin anymore and we'll be, we'll be more, the most human we've ever been. But that's what we have here, just in the first words, first three words of this section. And a leper. As I said, we don't get the, the outrage of what this sentence does. Because this leper comes to Jesus. And this is more than a story just of consuming need. It's one of considerable faith. The rest of verse 40 says that the leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. To come to Jesus, he would have had to violate every social custom. They were not allowed to enter towns. They were not allowed to come near people. They were not allowed, you know, they would have to wear rag, you know, torn clothes and shout if anybody came near them, unclean, don't come near. This man comes to Jesus. It's not just a story of consuming need. I'm going to say it's a story of considerable faith. <coughs> considerable and contemporary faith. It was faith in the here and now that brought him to, to the, if you like, the doorstep of Jesus. It brought him to Jesus' knee and said, please, if you want to help me, you can make me clean. Friends, I hope today our faith is contemporary. That it's here and now. It's not just referencing some time in the past. Where we think, oh, I really believed then. Or I was really close to Jesus then. Friends, that's not the, you know, our... Our growth in godliness is not to have a sudden burst of faith when we were young and then they slowly decline until Jesus comes. We are to be transformed from one level of glory into another. Our faith is to be growing. It is a growth in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. So take heart that even this leper has considerable and contemporary faith. And it's expressed in the statement. Notice what he says. Notice that it's not a question of ability here. It's not a question of maybe, of maybe Jesus is powerful enough to heal me, to cleanse me. Perhaps he'd already heard what Jesus had done in Capernaum. All who came, many were healed. Perhaps he'd heard of that. But the question is not of ability. The question is one of willingness. If you will, in other words, the question is posed to Jesus, who will you care for? Who do you care for, Jesus? Which is a bigger question. It's the question, what sort of Messiah are you? Who have you come to save? Now I'm sure that then as now, there's often the idea, the perception, that religion or faith, or even Jesus, is only really for people who already have things in order. Uh, I've been working in London for a couple of days, so a day, day and a half this week. And we were talking about the, the trend in Western Christianity for the church to become more and more middle class. More and more dissociated from the poor and the underprivileged. And it's a fact. And we've got to do something nationally and internationally about it. You may think today, even of Jesus, that faith isn't for you because you're not good enough. You might feel a failure, you might be burdened, even to the point of being bowed down under the weight of what you've thought, said and done, under the weight of this consuming need. You might think, well, you know, it's okay, Jesus, you know, Christianity is a wonderful idea, Jesus is a good book, but he hasn't come for the likes of me. If that's you this morning, then I want to say you're laboring under the misapprehension. You're laboring under a misapprehension about Jesus. Because what sort of saviour 
is Jesus. Well, as we see here, he's, he's compassionate. He has come to save sinners. Do you know the only qualification you need for Jesus to have come to save you is that you're a sinner? Jesus came to save sinners. The Apostle Paul testified to it, didn't he? Jesus Christ came to save sinners of which I, he says, am the foremost. That's a statement in our life. If you think about it, Paul says, and it's in the scripture, so we believe it, that he was the worst sinner who's ever lived. As a human being. I'm the foremost example, he says. But if you think about it, he was a religious terrorist. He persecuted the way. He threw Christians in prison and had them killed. He, he stood and approved at the stoning of Stephen. So Paul wasn't exaggerating. Paul wasn't in that point using hyperbole and saying, oh, I'm worse than I say I, I am. No, he knew who he was. He never forgot who he was. He never forgot what happened to him on the road to Damascus. The only qualification for Jesus to save you, to cleanse you, to set you on another path in life that leads to eternal life and not eternal punishment is the fact that we are sinners. And Jesus shows his compassion to this leper and to us and to all who will believe by saying, I am willing. Be clean. What sort of saviour is Jesus, friends? He's a cleansing saviour. Jesus' kingdom advances in Mark 1 and today by Jesus cleansing sinners. Jesus cleansing people like you and me. Now, again, you might, not be, you might not be aware of your need for cleansing. But let me tell you, as Christians or non-Christians, we all need cleansing. Yeah. We need cleansing on a once-for-all basis as we repent and believe in, in, what God, in what Jesus has done for us. That's what we call saving faith. That's a once-for-all cleansing. But there's an also a daily cleansing, isn't there? We did it this morning, together. I hope you do it every, every day in your own personal life. Where you come and say, Lord, I know I've messed up again. But as 1 John 1, 9 says, if, if I confess my sin to you, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to oh, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That doesn't mean you've lost your, you've lost your, you've lost your salvation in between. Contrast some, perhaps some brands of, of the church. You haven't lost your salvation as a Christian between now and the next time you sin. But it means that the, if you like, the, the transparency of your relationship with Jesus has been spoiled because you've messed up. I say in this week's um, bulletin that left to my own devices, I'm brilliant at messing up. I'm not brilliant in any other way, but I'm brilliant at messing up. I'm brilliant at pressing that, you know, Self-destruct button. That's why we need the presence and the power of the Spirit of God in our lives, isn't it? The very presence of Jesus with us as Christians, we need that. Because left to ourselves, we're still, we're still wayward and wandering at times. How much time in this last week have you wasted? If you're honest. And we're in a culture that gives us lots of ways to do it. You know, we can all spend more time on social media, those of us who are into it and got it, than we ever do in the Bible. We can spend more time doom scrolling. You know what doom scrolling is? No. It's when you're looking on your phone at the news and it's bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. Mm -hmm. Or you're looking at Twitter and it's oh, bad news, bad news, or Facebook, bad news, bad news, bad news. It's called doom scrolling. And all you're doing is increasing the level of your own sense of doom. Spend so more time doing that than actually praying. Listen, thankfully, Jesus has come to cleanse us. Amen. Friends, have you been cleansed this morning? I don't mean this morning, necessarily, but do you know Christ? <coughs> have you repented of your sin? Have you put your faith in him? Have you been baptised after that as a declaration of that in water? Are you walking a new life? As a Christian, are you, are you walking in that relationship with Jesus where, yes, I understand that your communion will go up and down, your recognition of what Jesus has done for you will alter, it does with me, but the fact of what he's done is absolutely stable. We have been justified by faith alone, in Christ alone. 
Yeah, and it's Christ who saves. Jesus touched the leper. This man, this, I say a man, this person receives, experiences, cleansing. Jesus touches, touches him. And wonder of wonders, his love and mercy and power are such that instead of making Jesus unclean, because he touches the leper, what happens? The leper is cleansed. What power that is. What grace that is. I'm a, I'm a bit of a Marvel films fan. Uh, you, don't have to, you can pray for me later. <laughs> and and there's, there's, there's one character who's what part of the Avengers, and she's, a, she's, a, what, she's, she's the, she's the f- female Avenger, she's called Black Widow. And she's led a really bad life, she was an assassin. And she says in one of the films, there's a lot of red in my ledger. In other words, she did a lot of bad stuff. And she goes to this other guy in the film, uh, who's, who's again a villain, and he's sort of trying to undermine her, and he says, can anybody actually get rid of that much red? Can anybody get rid of that much? In other words, bad stuff, all your thoughts, all your actions, all the stuff you've done, can anybody get rid of that? And of course, I'm sitting watching the film, going, yes! <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not Captain America. <laughs> it's not the Hulk. It's Jesus. Amen. Only he can set our ledgers straight. Only he can take all the red, all the black, all the sin, all the... All the horror. True cleansing, friends, is only in Jesus. And that's whoever we are. You know, one of the ways, I'll be honest, one of the ways I love that Cumbria is changing. Uh, as I said, I went in London for two days and um, I, 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 put, I put coming back on Twitter. I said, I've been to London for two days. It is really a different country. It's not a city for me. It's because, you know, I'm used to sort of, you know, sky and, you know, space and, you know, not being trampled on by loads of people trying to get to work. <laughs> I felt like a bit like Crocodile Dundee. I was walking through going, hello, because I'm used to saying hello to people in White Haven. All right, how are you doing? Mm-hmm. Champion? You know, I was saying that in London and people were going, what on earth is he talking about? <laughs> get out of my way! You know, is he asking me for money? No, I wasn't. I was just trying to get to where I was going, but it seemed to be the opposite way to everybody else. <laughs> But one of the ways I like about how, uh, the way West Country is changing is that we're no longer a white, working class monoculture. Do you know what I mean by that? Mm. Yeah. You know, that we have different people from different countries, different skin colours, and yet as far as the Christians are concerned, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. That's pleasing to me. Yeah. That's part of, you know, you know I just remember, remember South Africa used to be called the Rainbow Nation? You know, after, after the transition from apartheid to hopefully free and fair democracy. Something that's rationed even in our country these days. Oh, politics. Um, <laughs> friends, the Christian church is the true rainbow nation. Because wherever we come from, whatever our background, whatever our skin colour, whatever our ethnicity, we are all one in Christ. Yeah. And I tell you, on that day when we're all gathered before the throne, that, that's, you know, I, I'm going to be looking, I want to be looking around and saying, you know, where's the West Cumbrians? You know, where's the West Africans? Where, where's, where's the East Asians? Where's the, where's the, you know, where's, where's the representatives from the Pacific Rim? Where's the representatives from ancient Phoenicia? Because they're all going to be there. You know, North Africa, you know, North Africa was once a Christian place. First four or five centuries, it was Christian. It was one of the one of the, heart, one of the the breeding grounds of Christianity. Not so much since, of course, although the gospel is making inwards into Islam. Thanks be to God. But, but everyone, you know, across our, you know, across our one human race is going to be represented there. But it's only because they've all been cleansed in Jesus. There's going to be businessmen there. There's going to be. Uh, Vagabonds there. There's going to be doctors there. There's going to be um, bin men there. There's going to be accountants there. There's going to be leper, ex-lepers there. There's going to be people who've been healed there. We'll all have experienced ultimate healing by then. But we're only going to be there because of Jesus. Notice, I'm going to finish now. Notice what, what happens, because this story goes on, of course, because he actually heals him and he's cleansed. 
kingdom advances through cleansing. Notice verse 43 and 44, the commanding humility of Christ though. He's just done what was never done to a, an Israelite in the Old Testament. Cleanse the leper. There was a leper cleansed in the Old Testament, wasn't there? Remember Naaman? Was he an Israelite? No, he wasn't. He wasn't. Jesus cleanses. It was, a, in a sense, a messianic sign. Certainly in the first century, it was an expected messianic sign. Jesus doesn't say, get the trumpets out. Get the social media going. You know, get, get, get writing articles. He says, you, shh, don't say anything, but go and do what, what is required by the law. In other words, show your gratitude, show the change in your life, not by just using your mouth, but by living righteously and by living in a way that, that shows true gratitude and gives true glory to God. I would not have done that. I'd have told him to say, here's my card. <laughs> Go and tell as many as you can. I'll be all week. <coughs> you know, the humility, the humility of Jesus is, is not only in his command, but it's commanding. Because he knows what he's come to do. He hasn't come to be pushed into a, a mold by anybody else. He's come to be who the Father says he is. He's come to do what the Father has told him to do. He's come to accomplish that which God has set before him. In his suffering... And in his exaltation. And then he finishes. Mark 1 finishes. Finishes with an interesting contrast. The leper goes away and actually does the opposite of what Jesus tells him to do. I'm not saying he doesn't go to, and, and, and go to sacrifice and things like that as a, as a good Jew. But he, also, he goes away and he shouts it. This, this man who was excluded... And he's now cleansed. This man who had to stay in the desolate places because, because he couldn't come near was brought in. And strangely enough, there's a role reversal happens. Because now Jesus can't go anywhere. Now he can't go to the towns. He has to stay in the lonely places. And I don't want to push this too far. But friends, there's a lovely picture, isn't there? I think. Of what happens even when we are cleansed by Christ. There's a picture of what we call imputation. That great transaction that takes place when you bow the knee to Christ and you put your faith in it. What happens? Our sins are laid upon Christ. They were laid upon him in God's economy at the point of his death. And Christ's righteousness is credited to us. You know, this is better than Marvel. Yeah, Black Widow could only, couldn't get her ledger cleansed of red. Well, our, our ledgers are, are not only cleansed of red. The debit side is not only cleared. We are actually credited with the positive righteousness of Christ. The, the, the righteousness that comes from Christ's active and passive obedience. His perfect life. Imagine that. Put your name at the top of, of a sheet of paper and right underneath it. I possess the full righteousness of Christ. That is my standing before God. Because I am found in Christ today. Yeah. Friends, if that doesn't comfort you as a Christian, I don't know what will. Because that gift and calling of God, taking a little verse out of context there, but don't, don't hit me, is irrevocable. Once you are justified, you can never be unjustified. Because if you, if you never be unjustified, then you weren't justified in the first place. Yeah? It's just the reality of New Testament theology. You can't, can't, can't be like that. And I know there's sort of pastoral questions. If you want those answered, come to the Bible study. And John will answer them. Um, <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, revo- a role reversal here. The man is cleansed. And he walks around in, with his family. And he's reunited, perhaps, with his family. He goes back to his, 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 his friends and says, look... And Jesus is now on the outside. But even that's all part of, in the sense, of Christ's mission. And what happens? People, it says, are coming to him. Friends, how is the 
kingdom advancing in Mark 1, it's, it's advancing by Jesus' mission, by his preaching, by healing, by preaching the gospel and declaring the kingdom and by cleansing. How will it advance for us? Well, we need to pray for those who are in need of cleansing around us. We need to be courageous. We need to be compassionate. We need to reach out to them in a way knowing yeah, that the, 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 the greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Yeah. Friends, be encouraged today. If you've been cleansed by, by Jesus, be encouraged. And let's worship in the light of a cleansing saviour. Let's do that. Let's respond to God's word. Let's respond to this cleansing saviour. Get a chance again to raise your voice in thanks and praise, both as part of a, a song that we join together and maybe individually just to say, thank you, Lord, either silently or verbally or out loud to encourage others. Let's do that. Let's respond to the truth that Jesus has cleansed us, that Jesus is a cleansing saviour.
The way of cleansing is open for us, friends. But it is only open <coughs> through Christ and Him crucified. Let's rejoice together, even as we pray. Let's bow our heads. Almighty and heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the cleansing that comes from you through your Son, the Lord Jesus. Lord, we want to thank you for sending him to be one of us, to be our representative and our substitute, to live for us, to live the life that we could never live, to die for us, to die the death that we should have died, <coughs> to be raised for us, and to be exalted, that one day we might be raised physically, and that we will be exalted with him. We thank you for the glorious union of Christ and his people. We thank you that we conceive of no separation between us. And Lord, we, can, we can't conceive it because you cannot conceive it. For who shall separate us from the love of God? Of nothing in this world. Nothing in heaven, nothing in earth, and nothing under the earth. So we're grateful, Lord. We're grateful that you continue on the pathway with us. You are unchanging and we are ever changing. We are ever changing into the likeness of Christ. Father, we are strangers and pilgrims. And Lord, we thank you for the means of grace that you give us that we might be encouraged. We thank you for your word. We thank you for prayer. We thank you for communion. We thank, we thank you for, for songs that rehearse truth to us. 
Thank you for the local church whereby we can be fashioned according to your purpose for our lives. Lord, we pray for your church locally and internationally. Lord, that you would in these days raise us up. Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to be faithful to the good news of Christ. Lord, that you would help us to be courageous as we preach Christ and him crucified. Help us, Lord, to be strong in a way that's necessary against the, the sin and the iniquity that surrounds us. Lord, help us too to be compassionate to those who are still in a lost and dying world. <coughs> Father, we pray for our nation. Lord, we recognise and confess that it, like, many, like all other nations, has rejected your will and your ways. Lord, we pray that you would in your mercy awaken the hearts of men, women, boys and girls. Lord, by the means of the faithful proclamation of the gospel in our land. Father, we pray for those in authority over us. We ask that you would direct their hearts toward righteousness and justice, toward honesty and honour. Lord, we ask that you would grant our leaders wisdom in the making of just laws. Father, we pray against the work of the enemy, his servants, their work and its effects. And Lord, we pray for one another. We pray for our brothers and sisters here gathered. Pray your blessing will be on each one. Pray that you would garrison their hearts. Pray that you would encourage them. Pray that you would establish them firm in their faith. Pray that you would clothe them with the very armour of God. Pray for those who can't be with us today. <coughs> those at work. Those who are providentially hindered from gathering. Those who are sick. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling in their faith. Pray for those who feel, Lord, that their needs are all consuming. Father, I pray that you would encourage them to come to the, the compassionate Saviour and receive cleansing again. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.
Now may that life give him <coughs> a death sustaining hope. May the very person of Christ encourage you, empower you, enrich your soul this week as you walk with him and in him. The Lord richly bless you. Amen. Amen. Amen.